Sometimes the truth isn't good enough, you know? Sometimes people deserve more. Sometimes people deserve to have their faith rewarded. So it's time to go beyond. It's time. Black man, going beyond all the time. Tell your friends, tell your mom. That this pod is the bomb. It's the black man. Yep, the star of the show. Staying humble, but sometimes you just gotta let them know. It's the black man. Oh, yes, the black man. Hey everybody! Hi. Welcome to Northern Fan County. You guys having fun? I'm not sure if I believe that. Are I'm not guys? sure I did either. Come on, you guys! Yeah. See, I can, we can't see you. No, it's so a we mystery. We gotta hear you. Okay. Um, uh, this is my fifth Northern Fan Con, I think. Every time I've been here, I have done a podcast of some kind. I did Fat Man Beyond with Kevin the first year. We did a Battlestar Galacticast with Trisha Helfer and Michael Hogan the, the following year. And then we've done some Black Man Beyonds, which is the podcast that I do when the fat man, Kevin Smith, is not with me. And so I'm so glad and honored and overjoyed to have uh, Mary McDonald with me. This is Bananas. Now, Mary and I have met a couple times before. Uh, the first time we were at uh, Emerald City Comic Con in Seattle, where Trisha and I did a, did a Battlestar Galacticast, where she was with us. We then met again for the series finale of that Galacticast podcast. Mary was gracious enough to zoom in from a remote location and join Trisha and I. And then we saw each other in the picket line a couple of times when we were both out there uh, uh, fighting for our rights. But... Uh, I am sure you did not remember the first time we met. Um, no. <laughs> so uh, at Comic-Con, uh, San Diego Comic-Con in San Diego, California, uh, the Science Fiction Network and Entertainment Weekly used to throw a joint party. Oh, yeah, up on the roof? Up on the roof. At the, I think it was the Solomar Hotel back in the day. And so Sci-Fi would bring all of their shiny casts, of which Battlestar was chief among them, I was an editor at Entertainment Weekly who was the resident nerd who lobbied for coverage of Battlestar Galactica and so forth and so on. And so I was at this party. The Battlestar crew was at this party. I had had like one or nine too many drinks. And, uh, and I met Mary and Jamie and I think it was Tamo. And, uh, and then I turned to you. No way you should remember this. I'm not sure I should say this. But I remember turning to you and saying, I am the biggest fan. I've cleared it with my wife if you want to come and live with us. I thought about it. <laughs> and uh, He's very cute. But you, you very graciously said, oh, dear boy, thank you. That's very flattering. <laughs> dear boy. Dear boy. <laughs> You're adorable. Uh -huh. um, but, and then I, you know, I was, that was the party for being just drunk enough to say something stupid. Oh, that we've you all been said. there. We've all been there. Have we not? Yeah. <laughs> and if you have them, you better try it. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I said the same thing to Nathan Philly in the year after. Just, I cleared it with my wife, and it's okay if you come live with us. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I – and this is, this is so much fun because for as much time as you've gotten to, to interact and spend with each other, there are still questions that I have for you, questions we did not get to, to talk about on the Galacticast. And first, I want to know what you wanted to be when you grew up, when you were a kid. Like, what was the, before you chose acting, before acting chose you, or you're like, I'm going to be a X when I grow up. Okay, so believe it or not, the um, very first thing that I actually truly thought I wanted to be <laughs> was a nun. And one of the reasons, well, there was a couple of things. I was a water ballerina and a competitive swimmer almost before I could talk. What was your stroke? A butterfly breaststroke in the relay. Oh, damn. Yeah. And I hated butterfly, but it was okay. But then after a while, I quit butterfly. But water ballet was really where I discovered that I loved performing. I had no idea. But the nun thing came because I had a fifth grade teacher. I was raised Irish Catholic. And a fifth grade nun, and her name was Sister Donald James. It should have been a clue that she was a little different, right? And 
she came, she was the best, most inspiring woman. It my water ballet coach was inspiring because she was beautiful and she would watch us practice while she was smoking Salem's. And it was just we all wanted to be her. And then my fifth grade nun came to us and said, I won't be here next year. We said, Where are you going? She said, I'm going to get a doctorate. And I went home that night and I had five sisters and my brother was a baby. And I said, Dad, what's a doctorate? And I learned about what it was. And I said, Well, I want I want to be a nun. They get to go and learn and learn and be independent. And they don't have to get married and raise kids and cook food every night. I'm in, right? But then there was the other part of me that wanted to be my water ballet teacher. So I I got confused. Then I hit puberty. I didn't want to be a nun anymore. I, I um, feel like that's a tale as I'm old like as telling time. you too much. <laughs> Listen, I started by telling you too much. So okay. All right. Yeah. I feel like we're in the same right. place. But I did not discover that I was an actress or wanted to be an actress until college. Yeah. And I stump, literally kind of stumbled into it. And my entire brain came alive. My soul came alive. Everything changed. Every single thing. So there wasn't a, I mean, because Ithaca, New York, like I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with it. I grew up in New York also, but further south, like in the city. So like, was there a culture scene in Ithaca? Like, I know it's a college town, but was there theater? Well, was there? At the, I spent a great deal of my life outside of Philadelphia before we moved to Ithaca. Mm. I didn't move to Ithaca until I was in ninth grade, eighth grade. So my growing up was suburban Philly. Okay. It so was Wilkes-Barre. watching them build the biggest mall ever while riding our bikes, eating soft pretzels with mustard. Mm. And swimming. Competition. Swimming. Competition. Competition. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so... So after you you graduate from college, you begin on the stage, yes? Do you miss the stage? Well, I've done a couple of plays recently. A mm-hmm. couple of years ago, I played Gloria Steinem. Ooh. And it was very interesting. To You all know who Gloria Steinem is? Thank you. And if you don't, find out. <laughs> I have an airlock. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that went right over your heads. Okay. Um, I'm just threatening people in the crowd. Like, by the way, yeah, I will toss you out an airlock. I will toss you out an airlock <laughs> if you don't find out who she is. Greatest feminist of our lifetime, by far. So I got to play her, but I had to play her in front of her. Oh, no. And it was direct address to the audience. So I'm pretending to be Gloria Steinem, looking at Gloria Steinem, saying Gloria Steinem words. And I'm a child of the 70s. It felt like I was doing acid. (laughs) It was suddenly, I was completely out of body. And I didn't think I was going to survive the moment. And then I said another line and she laughed and slapped her knee. And I went, oh, I got this. (laughs) Yeah. So that was my last play. Did she have notes for you? I go back occasionally. What? Did she have notes for you? No, she couldn't have been. She's an absolutely brilliant and delightful human. She's yeah. amazing. Absolutely amazing. Excellent. Um, for, the, for the people in the audience who have aspirations of working in television and the theater and film, can you explain what, like, the life of a jobbing actor is? Like, what that stretch of, because you, you had that, that run where you were like, I'm just working. I'm going to do the soap opera. I'm going to do two, yeah. two episodes of this. I'm going to do a season of this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be on ER, two separate ERs. <laughs> the only human who's been on two ERs. Is that true? No. Yes. No. George was, e- no, he wasn't ER. He was in the ER ER. You was... had the slash ER. Yes. Well, so did he. Did he have an ER also? He was Conchata Farrell's nephew and he delivered pizza. <laughs> George Clooney and I share this. We but were in both ERs. Yes. There was a sitcom. ER. Yes. That was on for like a season. And then there was the ER that made everybody rich and famous and right. ran for 15 years and won all And the I was years. not on that one. Until you were a guest star and you were Emmy nominated. Oh, yes, be. I was. You were Noah Wiley's mother. I was right? Noah Wiley's mother. And when they offered me the job, they said to me, it's three episodes and 
we can't promise you an Emmy role because we just did that for Sally Fields and it's going to piss off the rest of the cast. And I said, I, I, I didn't come here looking for an Emmy. Just what is the role? And I got the Emmy <laughs> nomination anyway. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, that's the way we roll here, kids. Um, is it, you've been Oscar nominated twice. Is it actually an honor just to be nominated? No, it's terrible. To be <laughs> no. To, okay, so there's this luncheon that happens like the week before where everyone's still a winner and you're all together and it's really friendly and fun and you kind of all feel good and then you're a loser. And you, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what, <laughs> what you've said to yourself every night leading into it doesn't matter. It's just an honor to win. It's great to be there. All of which are true, except though it doesn't matter if you don't win, particularly for a competitive human mm. who was raised in, in competition. You feel like, oh, I did something wrong. I didn't win. What did I do wrong? <laughs> What's wrong with my dress? What's wrong with my hair? What's wrong with my face? No, I'm teasing. It isn't, it is delightful and it is an honor, but losing, you do like have a moment where you go, huh, huh. <laughs> I mean, the Did best version of that is Sam Jackson, who doing? they, they caught him on camera when he was nominated for Pulp Fiction. And so they do the thing where they're like, and nominated for blah, and they run through yeah. the names. And then, and the winner is not Sam Jackson. And they just catch him saying, motherfucker. Oh, yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah, and, like, that's the only time I've ever seen the betrayal of actual emotion because yeah. everybody else, placid, stone-faced. Yeah. Yay, oh, right. I, can I tell you another story? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I was nominated for an Emmy for The, the, um, the Closer mm -hmm. when I, before Major Crimes. Thank you. Thank you. Closer fans. And... So we go to the Emmys and it's, it's the, there's two different kinds of Emmys. So it's the first one because it was guest star, you yeah, know, the yada, yada. Arts Emmys, yeah, right. yeah, the creative arts Emmys, but you still, it's red carpet. You get dressed up the whole bit. It's like packed. And I was sitting with a lot of band of brothers, people, Tom Hanks, you know, that we were all in this group. So you, you get, you develop a camaraderie with ever, whoever your neighbors are doing one of these things. Whoa. Yeah. Um, and so what happened was when she announced the winner, and I can't remember who it was, she went like this with her lips, which is M. I was the only M. Tom Hanks went, put his arm, I started to get up, and then she went and said someone altogether different, and we all went. And, and John Hanks goes, you got robbed. You got robbed. We're just joking around, right? Okay, fast forward. It's over. We get up. We're walking to the after party, same building. Happened to run into so many people from New York, our days in New York. We're all standing there. And we're laughing about the M moment. And someone taps me on my shoulder. And she says, I turn around and there's a woman I've never met or never seen. So you get a little at these events. And she goes, Miss McDonald, may I talk to you for a minute? And I said, yes. Okay. She goes, well, can you step over here? And I said, of course. And she said, can you go into the ladies room? And I'm like, well, this is getting weird, but she seemed lovely. And I said, of course, and we go into the ladies room. She goes, I'm sorry, please forgive me. One of your hair extensions has come out and you have a tail on your dress and I could not live with myself if I didn't tell you and honestly I was so scared you were going to win because at one point you stood up and I saw the tail and then you sat back down and I thought you would walk up there and get an award with a tail <laughs> and sure enough I reached back and there's this extension oh my god anyway that's my favorite award story the kindness of strangers the kindness saving of strangers. you from your own tail. and also me trusting her i know because like, no one else told me but you also, know what i mean you that's went, competitive people there but you went with a stranger to a secondary location i did you should never do that well <laughs> hey you know we all have a little bit of a rebel in us and you know 
listen. I, I, I don't know. Okay. Um, you also have to tell me now. Uh, what? Oh God, there we are. Just I know. Started. We're huge. Um, when you show up on a set with Robert Redford and Sidney Poitier and Ben Kingsley, like, is, is the reaction, how in the hell did I get here? Or is it, we're actors ready to do a job, let's just go? Um, <clears throat> that was at a certain point in my career, it was happening fast. Mm. And I was not really anticipating it so to be with suddenly with all of them so we're at the first read through it was back in the old days when it used to be on a sound stage and the suits would come down from the tower everyone would sit around and they'd watch you read the script for the first time okay my very first line in sneakers was to look robert redford dead in the eyes and say we're not getting back together. Who says that? <laughs> to Robert Redford. I grew up in love with Robert Redford and Paul Newman. So I looked right at him. My heart was pounding. My mouth was dry. Everything was a wreck. There's Sydney Port. Everybody's watching. And I go, well, just like that. I could not get the line out. Everybody held. <laughs> and Redford just leaned in and went, What's going on, Mary? And they just drilled down in. I said, I need a minute. <laughs> but we got past it. And then it was cool. And it was an honor. I learned so much. And Sidney Poitier honestly was the most gloriously graceful human being I've ever been around. He taught me so much. He was the most patient on the set. He never, ever said anything that wasn't necessary. Mm -hmm. He was loving and kind. And the best advice he gave me, he said, I want to tell you something. When you get to be older, it's not about the money. It's about you don't come in before 10 and you don't work <laughs> after three. Don't forget that. <laughs> Which is fabulous, right? Hasn't worked for me, but it worked for him. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I I met him once. I was at a I was at one of these like Hollywood fancy lunches, and it was a producer of of uh, of certain quality. I was having this lunch with, and we were at some restaurant in Hollywood. I want to say it was like uh, I can't even remember. And he spies Sydney in the corner, who's getting up yeah. from his meal, and he's walking through the restaurant. And Sydney stops to talk to this producer that he knows. Yeah. And he was like, who's this? I'm not going to do a Sydney Poitier impression. I can't. It's not. No, nobody even, can. Nobody can. It's not even worth trying. Um, he said, who's this? And he's like, no, this is Mark. He's a young screenwriter. He's trying to make it. He's like, oh, you're a screenwriter. All right. And that's it. And then he just <laughs> walked off. And I'm like, oh, I know. He's, oh, he acknowledged my presence and yeah. said, all right. Yeah. This man. <laughs> I understand. And then, like, I called my mom immediately. I just met Sidney Poitier. I met Sidney Poitier, and he said, all right. <laughs> done. <laughs> Career's over. Oh, can, that's so good. I can retire happy. Or at the very least, my mom can yeah. retire happy. Now she just needs me to meet Denzel and then give Denzel her phone number. Oh, you can give him mine, too. I know. mean, apparently I'm going to be Denzel's hookup dude. It's like, hey, D, I got a couple ladies for you. I took my mom to see, I think he was doing Julius Caesar on Broadway. And I took her for Mother's Day once. And I spent the money on, like, the good seats. Yeah. And so we're, like, three rows from the stage. Yeah. And he's in the middle of, you know, the yeah, two brute. Like, he's in the middle yeah, of a big yeah. thing. And, then like, a spittle from Denzel's mouth arcs through the air and uh, lands on her cheek. Oh, my God. And she was just like, <gasps> oh. But Mark, I am never washing my face again. I'm like, all right, Mom. It's going to get weird. I love that. Um, she sounds great. She's adorable. Oh. She's, she's the best. I mean, she's a mom, and moms yeah. are all cool. Moms are great. Moms are great. Um, yours is a career that's marked very much with characters that have a sense of nobility, have a sense of clarity, of strength. What was the first word you said? Yours is a career. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> nobility. 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 Thank you, clarity, love. Clarity. Strength. Wow. 
So what was it like bringing those qualities to Madeline Usher oh, in the fall of the House of Usher? Yeah. Right? Because I'm pretty sure, unless I'm mistaken, that is one of your, if not only, villainous roles. Uh, yes. Or at least Although, uh, what, what I will say to you is I do not see Madeline Usher as villainous uh, by any means. you don't. Madeline Usher just, excuse me, but she fucking crushed things. Whatever was in her way. And I love the fact that she did that unabashedly, even knowing that she was part of the scorching the earth problem. There was such a root in her of determination, intelligence, and, and willpower. And I just never encountered a role like that. But I understood it. If your very first image or your last image of your mother is a woman who had crawled her way out of a, of a casket and was on top of a man who had abused her and she was basically strangling him to death, that's Madeline Usher's childhood image of woman and power. Mm -hmm. So if you start there, she made absolute perfect sense to me all the way through. And I don't see her as a villain. So there. Do you? <laughs> what I mean, I'd love to know. Should we? I mean, they dare not say at this point. They dare not? Oh. I mean, no, it's just me, you guys. It's just, I mean, because there's the, the of course, the every, every villain, every character is a hero of their own story. And that is required as both a writer of the drama and a performer of the drama. You have to believe yeah. what the character is doing and believe that in their minds it's right, right. and true and fair. Right. Outwardly, though, the audience yeah. brings their own oh. versions of whatever. And so was there, I mean, I guess the, the, the quality of the character and the magnitude of the role is the thing that draws you to it. Yeah. Um, what else goes into your math of choosing to do a role or not do a role? Well, the very first thing that goes into my math is what is the overall story? Because we've all read countless scripts where there was a great role in a not so great story. So to me, it's like, what is the world that we're bringing to people? And does it matter? Right. Does it matter? And if it does matter, in what in what form is this? In what tone does it matter? Is it going to bring joy? Is it going to bring thought? Is it going to bring? What's it bringing? That's it for me. And then the character. So what, what were your first conversations with Mike Flanagan like? Mike is, first of all, he's just, thank you. Mike Flanagan is a delightful genius, period. He is so extraordinary to work with, right? So my first conversations were, the first thing that happened was Michael Truco from Battlestar, mm -hmm. who also is in the Flanniverse, right, <laughs> called me and said, listen, these guys I've been working with and I've done, you know, they um, have a role for you in their next project. So they asked for an introduction. And I said, well, if you love them, I'm sure they're delightful. And I said, what is it? He said, horror. I said, oh, God, Michael, I can't even watch horror, let alone do it. I mean, I'm just complete wuss. I believe everything. There's no filter with me. It's like I see an image. I think it's real. And that's it. I don't sleep for a year. You know, I'm afraid to get in my car. I'm afraid, you know. So I, I've not done horror. And he said, no, no, but these guys are brilliant. Ta -da -ta -da. And I said, of course, okay, well, I would love to meet them. And so we Zoomed. It was during COVID. It was Mike and Trevor. And, uh, you know, I basically told them that. And he goes, you don't have to watch it. You got to do it. <laughs> and I went, oh, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I had to watch Midnight Mass in order to understand Mike. Right. And I went, and I, I did it like that like this <laughs> the in between these moments was so brilliant I, said, I have to work with this man and then he sent me the script and i read it and i went i read madeline usher's last monologue and said okay i would kill to do to say these words so that's what happened um and how does that differ or, or maybe it doesn't to your initial conversation with ron moore about laura roslin 
and Battlestar. Um, <clears throat> this is how my conversation with Brown went. They offered me Battlestar. I was actually in Spago having lunch with my agents and saw Sidney Poitier. <laughs> Sydney is the glue of Hollywood. You guys. But Sydney knew me, so he waved and came over, right? Mm -hmm. So ha, oh, he came to me. Isn't that nice? No. Aww. We're teasing. I'm teasing you. Um they brought me a script. They said, We just got an offer for you. And I said, What is it? And they said, Well, you're not gonna believe this, but it's Battlestar Galactica. And I said, I didn't have a TV during those years, but wasn't that like kind of a wacky like sci-fi thing or you know that and they said, well, yes, but this is a reinvention. I said, uh-huh. Okay, well, um, let me read it. And so I went home, and I read fast when I get a script because I don't like to drag things mm -hmm. out. And I, I said, okay, God, do this. There's no way I'm not doing this. There's no way. So I called them that night, and I said, I want to meet Ron and Michael Reimer and David Icke first. I need to meet them. So we met two days later at breakfast somewhere, and we all talked. And then I turned to Ron, and Ron Moore, if you've ever met him, is one of the most, uh, he's quiet and brilliant and very graceful and unassuming. Uh, it, And meanwhile, there's this mind that is just brilliant. And I said, I do have a question, Ron. He said, yes, what? I said, um, so my very first scene in this, I get diagnosed with a fatal disease. Is this a long job <laughs> or a short one? And I was serious because I would have shot the pilot if that was it. Mm -hmm. It was so brilliant, right? And he goes, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no. He said, she'll be there the whole time and she won't die until she finds Earth. And I said, is there going to be like chemo on, in space? <laughs> he goes, there's going to be a lot of things you've never heard of. But she will go in and out of remission. So we already had that. Nice. So that's how I knew. Amazing. Uh, I think there might be a question from the from the crowd, perhaps. Uh, you, young camper. I, I just have a quick question. Yeah. What is your favorite uh, person that played your your husband? Are you fracking I, I, kidding me? I I, I don't know. I, if Where we, are you? Oh, I mean, you yeah. devil. Oh, I my mean, God. <laughs> so he wants me to play, do, like, Sophie's <laughs> Choice here? <laughs> You're on the spot. What you better is that? answer it right. Oh, well, there. I, I did do this movie with this guy named Bill Pullman. Have you ever heard of him? He might be my favorite leading man ever. Oh no! Please stay. Are you kidding? Stick around. I have I have questions. See, who wouldn't like this guy? Right? He's so handsome and talented. You can do better than that. Come on. <laughs> See, I got him warmed up for you, baby. Yeah. <laughs> We got to do a version of the Golden Bachelor, but like the Golden Couple, Presidential yes, Couple. Here we are. Um, and absolutely, I want to ask both of you because you both have played notoriously, wonderfully beloved science fiction presidents. Is there a trick to playing a president on screen, specifically a science fiction president? There's a there's a there's a lineage of it, and you guys have both become beloved doing it. So, what is the what is the acting challenge when you get cast as the president? I should take it. I've been talking for a long time. I mean, well, I I don't know. Um, you know, when we were doing it, the the first, uh, you know, putting the cast together and everything, and I heard the word that I was, you know, they would like to, you know, um, if I should be part of the cast as president of the United States, and I didn't know the movie. I said, oh, it must be a comedy. <laughs> I can do. And then, no. President Lone Star. Let's yeah. go. <laughs> That's right. And then, uh, but. Um, I, I I just remember how n a great uh, director Roland Emmerich is, and very, very uh, looking to accommodate and interested in input and everything. And I said, well, I, I guess the only thing is worried worries me is that if, if I don't feel presidential, will people behave that way to me on screen? You know, 
So he, he's, he agreed. He said, you know, I think everybody triangulates. No matter what conversation you're in, they're, they're queuing in the president. So I didn't have to. That was the trick. Somebody else had to figure it out. I just <laughs> treated me like a president. No, but I think, I think that's a great point because it's sort of people around you, the other characters, endow you with power. And so if you receive it, and sci-fi is no different than anything else. It's just you're a human in circumstances, certainly Battlestar and Independence Day, very human people trying to keep the world from ending. That's really all it is, right? But I love what you said about triangular, or what he said, yeah. Um, but there is a difference between the way women wield power and the way men wield power, right? Like there is a, and some of it comes from the people you're wielding it on, yeah. and some of it comes from the people granting you that power. So how does that inform your performance, understanding the way an overwhelmingly male populace of like fighter pilots and admirals and whatever, whatever's yeah, yeah, yeah. are going to treat you versus how, how do you defer power a little bit when you're looking to welcome people in? You know, I think that President Whitmore, part of his job becomes, I now have to deal with people I've never had to deal with before, don't like dealing with. I don't like this Goldblum guy at all. Like, but you still have to retain that feeling of authority while masking disdain. Like, what are, what are the, the tools? Well, for me, um, particularly when I played Laura Roslin, because there have been some women leaders so far in television, I found them kind of apologistic and not, it didn't make sense. But what I realized very quickly, back in those days particularly, Women in power said very little. So a great deal of holding power in the room was to get comfortable with withholding power mm. and then let them project whatever they wanted on you. And then eventually you started building power. So it sort of be the smartest, quietest person in the room as opposed to, I'm a powerful man. Not that that's how this man <laughs> behaved at all, but you that's know what I mean. That's really interesting. Did you have to tell the writers that? Did you ever say, I don't need to talk so much in this scene? No, no. They told me that. I read the script. Oh. It's like, oh, I see. <laughs> Someone went through, some, some of one of you delightful fans once went through all of Battlestar and counted Laura Roslin's lines. <laughs> and we were all like, really? Are you kidding me? But... But it was truthful mm -hmm. to women in power. You, it was, we were not mm, there. We're still struggling, I think. Correct? Thank you. Thank you, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but writing women in power, we're still trying to, we're still working on mm. it. Yeah, it's getting better. It's getting better, especially with more female showrunners oh, who yeah. can kind of come aboard and understand that. I mean, I remember, I mean, we talked about it, I think, that time I almost hit on you, where I was uh, talking about the way my mother wielded power. Yeah. And the way, like, she would be furious with me for any number of reasons. And then the phone would ring, and she would have to immediately shift into, hello, how are you? Like, the, the inability to be able to carry anger through mm -hmm. situations, where I think men are happy to transfer right. that anger to, like, trying to buy this car and then I'm talking to my kid and then I'm going to like, it just, the anger becomes a feature where for my mother, it was a bug. And it was like, I got to not, I can't be this person now. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's right. you know, and so that's watching right. Laura navigate things of the, like, you know what? I can't, now is not a time for me to be a screamer, but just you wait yeah. because I'm going to throw somebody on an airlock and then we're going to scream. And she even did that quietly with very few words, mm -hmm. just get rid of them, kill them, kill right. her. But also, the one time when she really lost it, when she said, I'm coming for all of you, when they took Adama, it was really quite astonishing because it was the only time we saw Laura Rosalind truly lose her shit. So that, like your mom, and then she went right back to what needed to happen. Mm -hmm. And so with, with President Whitmore, there's a deep empathy for that character. 
right? Because then part of the journey of that character is losing a wife. My condolences. Um, <laughs> uh. So what is, what is that process for you of still maintaining that power, the authority of the, of the office, while being a broken man trying to, to grieve and trying to raise a child and trying to, to be a human, though the job requires more than humanity? Yeah, um, you're gonna hold it uh, okay, like no, a rock right. star. Like pretend I, you're uh, I, I just Mick was Jagger. signing autographs with a lot of people with lightsabers, and they they asked me to start the lightsaber, so I had to keep my finger on it. So I've been pressing this green light here the whole time. <laughs> and I, think, I don't need to do that, and I think you know. Maybe that's the secret to being a president is an economy of effort. <laughs> Stop pushing the green buttons. <laughs> that's so good. I also wondered, because I, you know, I, Mary and I have known each other for a long time. We have a lot of connections because we both come from Western New York State. And my brother was an English teacher in Ithaca High School. And Mary was a student of his and so mr pullman yeah. was so cute like his younger brother <laughs> and everybody had a crush on him it was really cool well I, and then all i heard about it was the bevy of mcdonald daughters that were yeah all quite charming in their <laughs> special way <Not> funny but <laughs> so it was but, meant to be but once battlestar galactic i said holy go girl you know this is such a great role and uh so much intelligence in behind it. You know, it feels like sometimes uh, um, the the genre of science fiction stories like that can you know get a little bit of a, a hard to penetrate uh, membrane on them, where you feel like the the reality of it isn't there. But I thought you you led the way, you know. And I also wondered about your wardrobe. <laughs> because what, you, I yeah, mean, what, what did you wonder well because i thought uh you know it's the part of the when there's a female leader and uh, comparing them to male leaders why do they have to pay so much attention to their clothes where men don't have to pay so much attention to their clothes well to be honest with you in battlestar i only had three suits and i kept saying okay i don't understand where the cylon women are getting all their clothes <laughs> So the Cylon women are coming on with, like, the most amazing outfits, and they're playing multiple people with multiple outfits. And he's like, Laura has to wear the same suit for seven seasons. And I'm like, well, I know it's an Armani, but it's not going to last that long. <laughs> but I'll take it. So I think eventually they started giving me kind of presidential clothes, but we didn't know where they came from. So it was kind of confusing. But when I played another female leader after that, I actually played a police captain. I had the most incredible outfits. I mean, like, oh, my God, can I be a cop? You know, and, and women have to dress. We just do. Part of it is I think we like to. Am I the only woman? in this room who admits she likes to dress. Oh, thank you. Oh my God, don't be timid. We like clothes, we, like, we do. But the other part of it is exactly what you're wondering about is why is that so important when you're trying to run a country, save a world? Why do you have to keep that? And I think you have to keep it, we have to keep it still because we're still programmed to see women as beauty and when she breaks from that and we're trying to let her lead us we are not culturally yet tuned to although there have been a lot of amazing female leaders all over the world now we're getting there but we couldn't do that before culturally the bias was too strong that's my feeling, if that makes well, sense maybe there's a little bit like uh, you can pull off some things that men can't like these shoulder pieces on this beautiful coat here. He if thinks, I wore that, he thinks you'd worry it's a about it. Pad. It's just a gun show? It's just me. I work out. <laughs> it's good. It looks good. Yeah. Uh, you both have been on long-running TV shows. What is the process 
between the alchemy, I guess, between here's the role that is on the page from the beginning to by the, because the Laura Roslin we meet in the pilot is not the Laura Roslin we meet towards the end of the show. There's an evolution. There has to be. That's how drama works. So how much of you is part of that evolution? How much of you is pushing the writers into a place that, that is giving you richer material? And I understand it's always a give and a take. It's always a, we're watching what you're doing. We're watching what you're giving. We're going to start writing towards your strengths. But how much of that is on you as intention? Like, I'd like this character to go X. Uh, okay. Uh, this is a quick answer for me. I have never been able to see ahead to a place where I go, this is what I would like to happen. And part of it is I grew up in the theater, as so did Bill. And so much of what I learned was the process of working with writers to sort of blossom what was there and find out what wasn't working, as opposed to, I would like this to happen in this scene, or by next season, I would like to be, or I won't come on your show unless you write me an Emmy role, throwback. Um, it's never made sense to me because I don't do that. So for me, it's always been, where, where are you go? Oh, oh, I see where you're going. And then discussion about that. But I view, wanted to say, had the impulse to say, I want this to happen or that in your show. No, I, what you said is ultimately, you know, the, the only way to go really is to let them blossom and you that, and hope that they circle back and, you know, are curious about your answer to it. But with uh, the center, which is the only thing that I went long with. Cause, By the way, it's amazing. Oh, thank you. But, you know, there would, that became, I was uh, at, at, in the first season, then they, the, I was invited into the writer's room at a certain point to, you know, because I had a lot going with the uh, showrunner, Derek Simons, and he wa wanted me to be involved in it. And so I, th the thing that he said always was, this is, you know, it's going to be like I'm reading your mail. I, we want to make it close to the bone and we want to use a lot of things that are in your own life. So I opened up to that first year of the writer's room just in one day for about three hours and talked to him. And then the whole second season was designed on uh, my autobiography. And they, they, um, I play a, a, a detective who's in upstate New York, just a little ways up the Hudson, you know, was our idea of where Dorchester was. But at its, at, in second season, a uh, long time, childhood friend invites me back to the Finger Lakes oh. where I grew up. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Which is where we yeah. grew up. So it was really paralleling all my life and um, and things between with my mother that happened that are getting incorporated into the second season. So it's that rare event where you don't have to ins insist on things. Yeah. The good things come. Oh, that's beautiful. So beautiful. I love that. Indeed. All right, I have one last question before we toss it to the crowd. If there's anybody who has questions for them, start a line and we'll figure that out. But what's the best rap present you've ever gotten? And I'll see if it beats. <laughs> I do have one, I'll but you one. have it. We'll I'll see start it and then oh, you can. I'll, I'll tell you the high bar so far is Dakota Fanning was interviewed and she said the best rap present she ever got was a horse from Kurt Russell. Which is not bad, right? No, no. So let's see where we go. Yeah. Is it a horse? I, I, I you said Dakota Fanning. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Because, yeah. 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 um, yeah, but it, I, it's mine is actually rooted in Canadian lore. Mm. The Whoa. best, yeah. Cause the best rap present, was the first rap present that I ever got. And that was on Spaceballs. Second movie, uh, first movie, I did a small part, but that was a kind of bigger part. And John Candy said, you know, was a, a you know, a very uh, influential person on my whole career because he um, was so generous. And for everybody, 
he had a very personal idea that he spent a lot of time executing, and everybody who got one, I'm sure, still has it. But he uh, would t- take a dog bone, like a little, and he had the props guy spray it gold and mount it on a plaque. And it, it, it was said, give me a little paw. John Candy, thanks for working with me. And it was the best. Oh, yeah. That's beautiful. That was it. Plus, it came with a story and, in a way, uh, uh, instruction. He said, Pullman, you got to promise me, every time you're a lead in the movie, you have to give everybody a cast gift, a wrap gift. Oh. You had to have it made for everybody. So every movie that I've been the lead on, and this is usually like 140 of whatever it is. You got to have 140 of them or so. That, the, what size are they? What's I, oh, what you size can be everything casters? from, you know, I, I try to make it particular to the to yeah. the project right. and everything. Like what it's made out of, you mean? Like- well, or, you know, the, the low end is you go to somebody who can... Uh, emboss something, you know, right? And I, you know, sometimes there in one movie, a thing where I had to have a, a knife was a particular thing. I gave everybody a knife that I engraved, you know, mm. and uh, so. But that was the the blessing and curse of John Candy. <laughs> so a lot wonderful. of crews benefited from his. I his love that <laughs> decree. That's yeah. so great. But you, my, I think the bet it was sort of a post wrap wrap gift and again i go back to the beginning like you did um uh several months maybe even close to a year after dances with wolves uh ended um i got a call from kevin and jim and they said are you going to be around yada yada we're in the neighborhood or jim was in the neighborhood and i said yeah he goes I'm just going to stop by say hi i said great I'd love to see you. He stops by and he walks in. He's got this big box with him. And he goes, I brought you something from Kevin and me. And I said, okay. And he opens it up and he pulls out, stands with the fist, white calf wedding dress. And all the costumes had gone to a museum in South Dakota. And for some reason, this costume was somewhere else. And I knew that I wasn't going to walk away with any of those because they needed to be preserved and put on historical display. And, you know, it's not like something I'm going to wear, you know what I mean, to get a Starbucks. Um, (laughs) So they gave me the uh, wedding dress. And I still have it. And one of these days, for the right charity at the right moment, I will auction it. But it is so stunningly beautiful. It takes my breath away whenever I look at it. So that's oh, my best one. Amazing. Uh, that's I. I have nothing else to say because holy shit. Um, so questions. I maybe people. Oh hey. Oh my goodness, you're right there. Hello. Hi. What's your name? Geneva. Hi, Geneva. Hi there. Do you have your own convention? Uh, if I had a dollar for every time I was asked that, I'd be not here. I'd be out <laughs> in Europe somewhere. <laughs> I wish I did. Um, Mary, I just wanted to ask you about Dances with Wolves. I, I mean, I love that movie. I loved you in it. You're just amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to know what your process was preparing for it, like the way you spoke and the just the dick that you held with the character. And you're just, it was just, an amazing, amazing performance. And I, I, I've just always wondered how you prepared for that. Thank you. First of all, um, uh, I auditioned for it. Um, and then I almost didn't cause I had attitude. I'd been off in Minneapolis doing a play and I came back into New York and my agent said, there is a, uh, you have an appointment to go audition for a Kevin Costner cowboy and Indian movie. And I'm like, first of all, I'm never going to get it. Let's just the, and secondly, cowboy. And and she said, well, I said, well, let me read it. Well, you can't, you know, you know, nobody's allowed to read it. I'm like, oh, great. This is getting better all the time. And I said, I don't want to go in unless I know something about this because I hadn't been quite happy with how 
Hollywood portrays indigenous. And I was like, I, I don't want to do that. And so they called back and said, you can come down to the hotel and sit in uh, the suite with the casting woman. And they're allowing certain people to come read it. I said, okay, I'll do that. So I grabbed my Greek coffee. I go down. I sit down. I started reading this thing. I got about halfway through and I stopped and I just started to cry. And I, I, the Catholic girl came out and I'm thanking God. I'm thanking guardian angels. I'm apologizing for my arrogance. It was a miracle. And what happened was, and it started the process, I came back the next day to read and Kevin said, don't worry about the accent. No one knows what she would sound like. So that's going to take a while to know. And I said, but the, the, the inability to speak in native tongue is con deeply connected to her essence, to the trauma at her core. So I, I will work with that. He just goes, fuck, <laughs> okay, you know. Sorry, I say the F word way too much. No, I don't. Not enough. <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> Not enough. Madeline Usher did it to me. It was every other word. And so that's where I began. I could feel her trauma with English. And so starting from the point, I think I play a lot of characters who start with trauma. Starting from there, I started to understand, and then they sent me a tape, this wonderful woman. She was our, our dialect coach. She, she recorded all of our lines and everything that was said to us in Lakota, and I had weeks to prepare. And then when I got there, I didn't shoot for a long time, so I was able to really listen and absorb. So by the time I shot, I felt like I understood where she lived, but it all came back to her heart and throat and the disconnect and what what meeting him and speaking English opened in her. Wow. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. So beautiful. Up in the rafters? Hello. Hey, what's your name? Jeff. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Doing well. I have a question for Madam President. Uh, oh, there you are. Right here. Where are you? <laughs> A uh, long-time fan of Battlestar Galactica. Um, really, I just wanted to know, uh, throughout the entire series, your character's uh, utter contempt and disgust for Gaius Baltar is <laughs> very, very apparent, especially as I've grown. I've been watching repetitively for, you know, every once in a while. And uh, I was wondering if you have a personal emotional pool of where that comes from, because as... Uh, I had asked Trisha Helfer. She told me that James Callis is actually quite a nice man. So I was wondering, do you have something that you draw on particularly for yourself to uh, emote? That, disdain. What, the disdain for Gaius Baltar. It, it wasn't hard for me to find disdain for Gaius, but James Callis is the most delightful, the funniest human on a set ever. So I had to really set up boundaries with, with James, right? But for Laura Roslin, Gaius Baltar presented the worst of the worst because her core was truly about order and, and, and structure. She was incredibly linear, and he was absolutely the opposite. So everything about him threatened her. And when someone threatens you and you can feel the threat, you can get if you're if unless you're a really conscious evolved human, you can get to disdaining them quickly, and that's kind of what she held. And he turned out to be the thorn in her side. But I absolutely loved what happened to them on New Caprica. Do you know what I mean? Because all humans ultimately end up looking each other in the eye and going, "Wow," you know. And anyway, I hope that answered. It does. Thank you. Uh, I have one question for the both of you before. Look, Anthony, don't worry about it. It'll be fine. If there was a single role that you've already played that you could revisit, who would you want to play? I 
Is this, I don't want to no, go back to any of them. No rivers you want to go and walk through one more time? I do have one. Mm. All the any slightly successful, or we wished it was more successful movie, but I did a movie called Mr. Wrong. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> ah, it was wrong. It was a very, uh, it was an odd uh, moment. Uh, um, but I played uh, a character who um, seems like it's Mr. Right, but becomes very quickly he's Mr. Wrong. And not because he's a mean or evil guy. He's just whacked. And he's desperately in love with Ellen DeGeneres played the part. And uh, I think, you know, it was a, a part that I just got really infected by because I was so loopy, you know. And um, I got to do things like, you know, show up. And she thinks first that he's, and Ellen is so good at the subtlest listening you know to the sky slowly start to turn from mr right to very wrong and uh she she was entirely successful in it but for some reason the movie didn't take off and i always thought wouldn't it be great because ellen always says it's the worst movie ever made and she <laughs> she'd never ever retouch it but wouldn't it be amazing if she changed her mind about that we had another whack at it <laughs> that's fabulous <laughs> i I don't have a film or a, no, but I do have a play. I did a performance of Summer and Smoke on Broadway with the another gorgeous male lead, but not as gorgeous as Bill, Harry Hamlin. And I found something at the end of that Tennessee Williams play that went against the grain of how she has been interpreted. And I saw her leaving, Miss Elma, leaving. Uh, her life and becoming a street woman as a liberation. So I never really fully enjoyed it because after opening night, there was this review. It's back in the day when I read them or I let people tell me about them. And the review went on and on to talk about how incredible my Miss Alma was and then how this actress completely blew it at the end. And it shook me up so badly that I spent the entire run in that moment that I knew Tennessee Williams would love. And I spent the whole time doubting it and struggling against it. So that moment never really went where it wanted to go. So if I could go back and they could put a wig on me and tape my face, I would do it all again. Do you know what I mean? Just to commit. That's the one. Bad memories. <laughs> Excellent. Ooh. Reviews, Hi. right? Oh. What's your name? Hi there. Um, my name's uh, Kaylee. Um, Hi. Nice to see you guys. Um, my, uh, I have a comment and a question for Mary. Um, yes. I guess uh, my comment would start off with, uh, like, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the Flanniverse. Um, and so when I uh, watched the most recent one, uh, Follow the House of Usher, uh, like, you portraying Madeline Usher, Usher was just, like, wickedly awesome. Like, because she's powerful and she's badass. And I feel like you played the role so well. Um, and even just when you walked on stage and, and just started speaking, I was like, oh, that's her. Like, it was uh, pretty awesome, pretty uh, kind of starstruck to see up there. Um, and I guess my my question um, would be uh, if, uh, because Mike Flanagan often uses a lot of the same actors and actresses in his uh, series, even though he's not with uh, Netflix anymore and he's kind of moved on a different... Um, Amazon. Yeah, Amazon. Um, and I think he might be doing something with Blumhouse or something like that. I'm not entirely sure, but um, if, uh, if presented the opportunity, would you work with uh, Mike Flanagan again? Oh, in a heartbeat. Um, and if uh, because of how awesome you were in uh, Fall of the House of Usher, would you be interested in working in any kind of horror movies again? Because I feel like with your uh, like, I feel like you're you're definitely one of the scream queens in my mind now. And I, I think that you just did such a wicked job. So I would thank love to you. see more horror. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. No, I think this is what I think. I would work. Um, I trust Mike Flanagan with my life. He's just he really is a gift to us. He's so brilliant about the culture. He knows what's happening. 
um, the fact that he allowed Madeline Usher to go after the Supreme Court decision, which happened while we were filming, he added it into the monologue. I mean, some of the things that women got to say about the way things are. So for me, it would be, um, but then I did enjoy like that last scene. I really enjoyed the horror of it. Like I was like, no, no, more blood. I need more blood. He's like, ready to go. I, I need more blood. He goes, no, it's fine. I go, no, no, I need. So reminiscent of of the last little bit of her mother at the very Correct. beginning, right? Correct. So it's just Bingo. like, yeah. do the whole spoiler. And it's like, that was just all connected. Yeah. It was just amazing, you know, yeah. like how, it all, how it all rolled out. Right. Thank you. And so in answer to your question, if I love the script, of course, I would do Hara now because it's a blast. Thank you. Thank you. All right, last question. You, sir, get the honor. Hello. 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 Um, my name is Chris, and uh, this is more of a conversation starter, and this is unrehearsed, so I apologize. Uh, but I was wondering if uh, we could gush about each other's favorite roles, uh, maybe some of the lesser-known roles that uh, you've been in. Uh, Yo, Bill, you could perhaps raise some praise on uh, Mary and vice versa. Mark, I guess you'd have to pick two from your favorite um, I'll go first. Uh, you were in a film called Sneakers, which I really, really love. And for Bill, uh, I was going to say Serpent in the Rainbow just as a horror trend because I think a lot of people talk about that. But being, being this is a sci-fi convention, I guess I would have to say uh, Titan AE. So that was more of a conversation starter. You can gush about each other's favorite roles, but hopefully a lesser known role that perhaps we, have, we may not know about that we may want to go and find and watch. Of you, go ahead. I guess I'll I'll gush first. Um, I I I am not the biggest romantic comedy fan in the world, but while you were sleeping is one of my favorites, and uh, and and it it it's the the deep empathy that we have for that character. It's the likability is the wrong word, but every. It's, the, it's what they used to say about James Bond, right? Every guy wants to be him, every woman wants to be with him. And I feel like that character was that in the romantic comedy zone. Like, just a wonderful man who finally got his moment. Felt like that. Um, I mean, Battlestar is easy, because you know my love for Battlestar. Um, but, I, but I think it's, it's passion fish. You know, I mean, it's just, I mean, all of your work is so, is so deeply moving and is so deeply um, crafted, but the, the work you got to do with John Sales, who is a master like that, that for me always just sticks out in my head. Thank you. Bill, so, yeah, I'm answering about you. I've talked to enough about you talk me. About it's her. okay. I didn't talk about him. Um, <laughs> When I saw you recently on the center, I I was actually startled because you're always going to be like the president to me. Do you know? There's you have an uncanny ability to take whatever it is you're doing and play it from a a kind of like a Jimmy Stewart thing, if you don't mind the comparison. There's a uh you carry a kind of humanity in you in you that it doesn't matter if you're playing a really kind of fucked up dysfunctional detective or the president i recognize myself in what you're doing as a human not as an actor obviously but and i i find that quality very rare because it implies a lack of ego and i really appreciate that about you Thank you. But, well, you know, I, I it's just, hard to do. Yeah, but it, the the summer and smoke that you did. Where was that? Was that? Uh, it was at the what the roundabout, roundabout. It became the American yeah. Airlines. And who, yeah, who directed? Uh, it was David Warren. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I just make just you talking about it gave me FOMO. Like I missed out on that, for, and I think about things that I'm most uh, impressed about. You know, the um, I, I love because I was talking about 
um, Star Galactica and th- how much I like that because I don't n- n- watch a lot of television. And so that had an intricacy and nuance that I thought was great. But I really wished I had seen that production. And thank you. I'll be around for when you remount it to get your second <laughs> whack at it. I'll be uh, first. Well, maybe we premiere. should do it together and we can. I can wear a wig and you can dye your hair and we could be like, <laughs> we could be, yeah, let's do it together. We'll, we'll do the mature version. Amazing. Yeah. Again, yeah. it's the golden couple. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the golden couple. Yeah. Awesome. Well, listen, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, everyone in between thems and theirs and what now? Just one more. Oh, a little wow. Guy? Little guy always Bring gets it. to go. Yes. I have a question for Bill. What was your favorite scene that you did in Casper? Oh, my goodness. I I have a feeling like if I say the wrong answer, you'll shoot me with that gun. <laughs> <laughs> Promise you won't? Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, the, you know, the, the, the tyranny of doing special effects movie in those years was that, uh, you know, it, it isn't as easy. It was harder than... And, uh, you know, when I have this uh, sword fight where I have a toilet plunger and I'm sword fighting with the ghosts and uh, that thing almost killed me because I had to go up backwards. And, of course, the whole time I was doing it, there was no ghost there. So I had to learn the whole thing of fighting with things that aren't there. And, uh, you know, it, it took a lot of work. And the. Uh, that was a kind of a favorite day because the crew and everything at the end of the day is one of those things that's impressive enough that they, you know, they do a little applause at the end of the whole thing. I thought, man, I killed that scene. I see the movie and then all those friggin' comics that were playing the uncles, they heard what I said and upped it. So they got a better joke out of it than I did. And uh, so my favorite scene was actually the one that <laughs> I in. felt like I got robbed. But <laughs> <laughs> Ghosts can be that way. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I didn't mean to bust in on yours. Oh, no, you didn't. no, this was great. Are you kidding? Oh, this my is God. amazing. Um, everybody, thank you so much for being here today. And thank you, of course, to the great Mayor McDonald and the incredibly gracious Bill Pullman, everybody. That has been Black Man Beyond for Northern FanCon. My name is Mark Bernardin. Uh, stay tuned. For this guy. Oh, you guys are adorable. Uh, so we'll be back. Same black time, same black channel. Uh, Smilecast.com or YouTube.com slash Kevin Smith. Good night. Jeff's kiss. Mwah. Be good, everybody. This is the cat. Greetings, everybody, and welcome to the AKA Ask Kev Anything. Every saga has a 10 year anniversary, ladies and gentlemen, and this is what happens when Jay and Silent Bob get old. I'm Kevin Smith. Kiss if you will.